Hello, I'm Sharon Wilson, uh, publisher of Resort Trades, and uh, welcome to another Trades Lunch Bunch. Uh, if you've missed any of our previous events, I would encourage you to go to Resort Trades channel on YouTube. Uh, and now, as far as this session goes, we welcome your comments and questions. Just go ahead and use the chat functionality. Uh, today, we're delighted to have as our guests uh, Lena Combs and uh, Brenna Agamite from Witham. Now, if you're not familiar with Witham, they are a highly respected uh, advisory and accounting firm, very technology driven. And Lena and her hospitality team have been very committed to helping resort clients many years. Uh, and plus, they generously contribute articles to resort trades, which makes makes us love them all the more, uh, such as uh, in your February issue, uh, they contributed the article 2020 report to the nation's insights and lessons on occupational fraud, which will be their topic for the day. So, uh, I encourage you uh, to look online for this article if you're interested in more information. Uh, I believe Carrie has posted it already, but if not, it will it'll be ready soon. So uh, today we welcome you, Lena and Brenna, as you expand uh, uh, and on this topic of occupational fraud. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for the kind words and the introduction and for inviting Brenna and I to be here today. In the files section, the uh, PDF of the article is available. I just checked that, so if anybody wants to download it, it is there. Sharon mentioned Brenna and I work in the firm's hospitality services practice here at Witham. We're happy to present today on the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, or ACFE, as you may hear us refer to it, 2020 Report to the Nations. This study, which is done every two years, reports on the data collected from thousands of cases of fraud committed against organizations of all types and sizes, including the hospitality industry. And here's why this is relevant to you today. In the report, hospitality companies experienced average losses of $114,000 over 60 cases in the study. This report covers over 2,500 cases of fraud from 125 countries, causing losses of more than $3.6 billion, which is just a fraction of the number of frauds actually committed. Occupational fraud causes tremendous costs to businesses, nonprofits, and government agencies around the world. And in order to deal with it, we must understand it. You'll hear us refer to occupational fraud. Occupational fraud is generally defined as fraud committed by individuals against the organizations that employ them for their own personal enrichment, and it is among the costliest forms of financial crime in existence. Today's discussion is just a very high-level overview of the report, and more information can be found in the article in this month's edition of Resort Trades. So now we wanted to ask a polling question. How many organizations represented on the call have been the victim of occupational fraud? While we won't wait for the result, results of our poll, which hopefully we'll get shortly, if you could all answer it, I just want to briefly provide a reminder about the fraud triangle. What causes an employee to commit fraud? Human behavior is very complicated. One prominent theory of what causes fraud identifies three factors, pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. The theory is known as the fraud triangle, which was documented in 1950 by professors from UCLA from interviewing inmates from the Illinois State, State Prison in Joliet. Pressure may be a crucial element in many aspects of life. The need to be financially stable or some non-shareable problems such as high medical bills, gambling debts, or excessive lifestyles can motivate an employee to commit fraud. Pressure can also come from an organization itself putting on employees by forcing an employee to perform better or cover up negative results in order to look good. Opportunity is another factor explaining fraud and usually more obvious than pressure. For any organization to function, a certain level of trust must be placed in employees. 
This factor arises when an entrusted employee violates that trust by taking advantage of their position to commit fraud. And the last is rationalization. This is typically a person's excuse for committing the fraud. In many cases, perpetrators tell themselves that they are only temporarily borrowing from the organization. In other cases, perpetrators might rationalize their actions with thought like they won't miss the money or the organization deserves what it's getting. Now that we have a background, oh, go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, fortunately, we don't have anybody who says their organization has been uh, the victim of fraud so so far in, in that poll. Excellent. So I will go ahead and close that poll, and you may continue. Thank you. I'll say that's probably because they haven't caught it yet <laughs> in a lot of cases. So now that we have a background on fraud and the why behind it, let's move on to some of the interesting data presented in the report. Our first section is about the common types of reported fraud. Brenda, can you share with us a summary of the types of fraud committed and the average losses incurred from these in the report? Thank you, Lena. There are three main categories of different fraud schemes. There is asset misappropriation, such as an employee stealing or misusing a company's resources for personal gain. And this could be any asset, cash, of course, but also non-cash assets, such as supplies, inventory, misuse of computers and software, etc. There's also corruption, such as acts of bribery, uh, conflicts of interest, and extortion. And then financial statement fraud is the third category, which is intentionally causing a material misstatement or omission to an organization's financial statements, such as timing differences, fictitious revenues, concealed liabilities and expenses, improper asset valuation, or improper financial disclosures. Now, keeping in mind, most fraud committed involves more than one type, so the percentages reported in the ACFE's study add up to more than 100%. Asset misappropriation accounts for 86% uh, of frauds committed with a median loss of 100,000. Uh, corruption makes up 43% of fraud cases with a median loss of $200,000, while financial statement fraud makes up only 10% of cases, but has the largest median loss of 954,000, which is nearly a million dollars. Wow, uh, thanks, Brenna. And the chart on the screen now, which is a little bit small, um, but will be available on the slides, shows the average median loss by type of asset misappropriation. So just a couple of additional details that I thought were interesting. First, we discussed that the most common type of fraud is asset misappropriation at 86%. And the most common type of asset misappropriation is billing schemes at 20% of those cases, which also has the second highest median loss. The second is that frauds caught within six months, which are 29% reported in the study, have an average loss of $50,000, while frauds with a duration of five years or more, which is 7% of the cases, had an average loss of $740,000. So the lesson here is that you've got to catch it fast to reduce your potential loss. Our next topic is how are the frauds detected? Brenna, we know that detection is an important concept because the speed with which a fraud is detected has, generally speaking, a great impact on the size of the fraud as we just discussed. Can you share with us how the case in the study initially detected the frauds? There are two pieces to detection. What, uh, who reports the fraud and how it's detected. Now, who reports the fraud could be employees, customers, vendors, competitors, owners, and other or anonymous tips. And how it's detected is broken down into uh, different methods. There's passive methods, which typically last longer and result in a higher median loss, such as accidental discovery, uh, brought to the attention of law enforcement, or confession. Then there are active methods of detection, which are typically shorter in duration and have a lower median loss. And these methods include an internal audit function, management review, document examination, account reconciliation, surveillance, and IT controls. And then there are a couple that could be considered both passive and active, depending on the circumstance. And those are external audit and tips. More than 40% of cases in the study were uncovered by tips, which is almost 
three times as many as the next most common detection method, which was internal audit at 15%. Employees reported 50% of cases of fraud, followed by customers at 22%. Police notification as the detection method, which is passive, involved frauds with a median duration of 24 months or two years and a median loss of $900,000, while IT controls, which is an active detection method, discovered fraud with a median duration of seven months and a median loss of only $44,000. External audit, which can be passive or active, uncovered frauds with a median duration of 24 months and a median loss of 150,000. Thanks, Brenda. That brings us to our next polling question. How many organizations on the call have TIP hotlines in place? <clears throat> While we wait for the results of that, we'll flip to this chart on the screen, which shows the concealment methods used. Keep in mind again that the percentages add up to more than 100% because frauds generally involve more than one method. The most often used method is creating fraudulent physical documents, such as invoices, etc. Interestingly, some fraudsters made no attempt to conceal the fraud at all. A couple of other interesting items of note around, from the report around how frauds are detected. Median losses were double at organizations without hotlines versus, versus those that had them. Employee training around fraud prevention increases the number of cases reported by TIP by 8%. 64% of victim organizations had hotlines, and organizations with hotlines detect frauds more quickly than those without, which is 12 months versus 18 months. The chart on the screen shows the way whistleblowers, <clears throat> excuse me, reported the frauds. So by telephone and email being the two highest methods. The other ones are by fax, mail forms, and those types of things on the chart. And small organizations are especially likely to detect fraud by tip. And often this is because they have less other controls in place. Well, interestingly, uh, the uh, according to the polls, uh, our viewers don't have any hotlines in place, which uh, at the end of our session, I'd like to ask you in greater detail if there's a, uh, a, a resource for organizations to go to on how to set up uh, a TIP hotline. Okay. Hopefully we can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so our third topic is about the characteristics of the organizations themselves that are victimized. So Brenda, it might be useful for our participants today for you to talk briefly about the types of organizations where the frauds reported in the study occurred. Can you share that information with us? Thank you, Lena. There are the following general categories of organizations. You have for-profit organizations consisting of private companies, which are typically close-held companies and public companies, which are typically those listed on some kind of trading exchange like NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. There are nonprofit organizations and then governmental organizations. 44% of frauds occurred at private companies compared to 26% at public companies, both of which have a median loss of $150,000. Nonprofit organizations only reported 9% of fraud cases and suffered the smallest median loss at $75,000. However, many nonprofits have limited financial resources to begin with, so a loss of this amount could be particularly devastating to these entities. Great. Thanks, Brenda. Just to add a little more flavor to the conversation, the report also noted the following. Basically, organizations with less than 100 employees are equally susceptible to fraud as those with 1,000 to 10,000 employees. The most prevalent weakness in internal controls is the lack of internal controls themselves. And hospitality companies fall squarely in the middle range or middle of the median range of loss for companies in the study, with the most prevalent fraud schemes as corruption first, non-cash second, and billing schemes third. We did have a question from uh, an attendee, can you conduct aud audit every other month uh, so fraud can be detected sooner? 
<clears throat> so I think that would lend itself more to an internal audit function. And the word audit gets thrown about and used in various types of vernaculars. So that type of thing would be more of an internal audit function where someone goes through the various processes of a company, cycles through them, and makes sure that those controls are working properly. So absolutely, yes, that would certainly help, but that's an internal audit function versus an external audit function. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Lena. All right, so our next topic is the characteristics of the perpetrators of fraud. So Brenna, can you share with us some of the characteristics from the study of the people most likely to perpetrate a fraud? Well, there are two main components to this, the role or the level of the person and their tenure with the company. And for purposes of the ACFE study, the level of the person was segmented by employee, manager, owner, and other. And the tenure of employment was segmented by duration of less than a year, one to five years, six to 10 years, and greater than 10 years. Now, the median duration of fraud schemes perpetrated by employees was 12 months in over 41% of cases, compared to 24 months when involving an owner or executive in 20% of the cases. Employees committing fraud with a tenure of greater than six years on average created twice the loss of those with five years or less tenure. The greatest risk of occupational fraud, monetarily speaking, lies at the board of directors level. The most prevalent uh, department for committing fraud, as recognized in the study, was operations, with corruption being the largest scheme followed as a close second by accounting, with billing being the largest scheme. Wow. Here are some further characteristics of the perpetrators of fraud as noted in the report. Now, keep in mind that we're giving the summary of what was in the study. We're not making accusations about any particular uh, gender or position or anything else. We're just reporting on what was in the study. That being said, males account for 70% of the fraud studied and 59% of the cases were in the US and Canada. The age range of 36 to 45 years represents 35% of the frauds perpetrated in the study. And those six year older had the highest median loss. 49% of the fraudsters have a university degree and the median loss increases the more highly educated the perpetrator is which makes logical sense. Our next topic and last is the results of the cases after the frauds are detected and the perpetrators are identified. Brenna, can you tell us what the study reports as the actions that were taken against those identified as the perpetrators of the frauds identified? There are basically six scenarios of internal actions taken against the perpetrators as reported in the study. Um, termination, the employee was no longer with the organization at the time the fraud was discovered. Uh, settlement agreement, a permitted or required resignation, probation or suspension, and in some cases, no punishment at all. 80% of perpetrators receive some punishment. However, owners and executives are less likely to receive punishment. Termination was by far the most common response to fraud in the study, but a third of cases ended with a different internal result. Many cases resulted in relatively light punishments where the perpetrator had already left the organization, 11% of the cases, had resigned in 10% of the cases, or received no punishment in 5% of the cases. 28% of cases went to civil litigation with a median loss of $400,000. And 59% went to criminal prosecution, which had a median loss of $200,000, leaving 13% of cases where the perpetrator was not prosecuted. 54% of victim organizations did not recover any of their fraud losses. Wow, it's amazing. Owners and executives in the study, in 13% of cases received no punishment. And employees were terminated on average 76% of the time, but owners and executives only 45% of the time. And the most prevalent reason for organizations not referring cases to law enforcement is the fear of bad publicity. So rather than recoup their losses and prosecute the perpetrators so that they can't do it to someone else, 
They just don't want the bad publicity and let it go. I just wanted to add here a couple of fraud cases from our clients that have happened within the last couple of years. And we have clients in the resort space and they've had frauds perpetrated in their companies. And so here's a couple of ways that those frauds were committed. The first was that company credit cards were used to purchase items for personal use, both in stores and online, and were delivered to the employee's home. And gift cards were also purchased of all sizes from five to $500 again, for personal use. The invoices were downloaded by the AP clerk, who was the perpetrator, and they were changed to reflect the resort address instead of the home address for delivery items. And then the items were changed to be inventory type items instead of gift cards or personal use things. Then the stummy invoice was used for payment and attached to the statement received by the company. The second way was company gas cards were issued. An employee left the company the card was returned to AP and was supposed to be canceled, and it wasn't. So the accounts payable clerk took the gas card, used it for personal gas and other purchases. When the invoices came in, the invoice was changed to alter the location where the gas purchase and other purchases were made. And then the expenses were charged out to different departments and companies, so it was spread thin and was less noticeable to those reviewing the financial statements. And the last example, was where a vendor colluded with an internal company employee to defraud the resort. <clears throat> the vendor would mark up their invoices for services and parts at the direction of the employee. The employee did not seek the proper approvals as required by the company's internal controls, and it went undetected. The resort was charged several times over for the same parts and repairs over a period of years at inflated rates, but the expenses were charged off to different entities and departments, again, making it less detectable. The vendor was paid the inflated amounts, who in turn kicked back a portion to the employee who had colluded with them. So when I asked them how they felt they could have prevented these frauds, the overwhelming answers were require vacations, functional cross-training of employees, have better controls in place, and ensure the ones in place are being followed, and ask questions if things seem out of line. These frauds that I just shared were not being looked for. They came to light by someone asking questions about things that looked odd in the financial statements. Uh, Lena, we had an interesting uh, event at the Gardens RV Village, the uh, retirement RV community in Tennessee that my husband operates. And uh, a, an employee took the uh, credit card went into Ace down the street, purchased furniture and lighting fixtures and things for his house. And the Ace manager, small town, called him up and said, something funny going on here. Did you really want all this furniture and lighting fixtures and stuff? And uh, so the uh, police caught up with him and his uh, response was, well, I'll, I'll work it off so because he didn't want to give the stuff back. <laughs> Great. There's that rationalization, right? I can just pay it back if I do it now. Um, yep. And that's, you know, like we said earlier, 27% of the cases that were tipped off were referred by customers. And that's, you know, that is a vendor situation, but very similar. Sometimes people know the cadence of your business and they'll call and ask you those questions. That's a great example, Sharon. Thank you. So just in a brief summary, um, I, I believe that the results of this study shows us that no organization is exempt from being taken advantage of by fraudsters. The key is for every organization to develop and implement some anti-fraud controls and implement proactive detection measures. Keep an eye out for behavioral red flags. Recognizing behavior clues displayed by fraudsters can help organizations more effectively detect fraud and minimize their losses. Some of these behavioral clues are living beyond their means, um, they're having financial difficulties, unusually close association with a, a vendor or a customer, control issues and unwillingness to share duties or take a vacation as talked about in our clients' fraud cases. Irritability, suspiciousness, or defensiveness when asked questions about their work. A wheeler-dealer attitude. Or divorce and family problems can sometimes cause issues. The report includes a fraud prevention checklist, 
which is going to be in the files section uh, on the webinar exam, if you're interested in looking at that, that's produced by the ACFE. So that'll be available to all the participants in the webinar today. Essentially, to reduce occupational fraud, an organization should be aware of its risks and its internal weaknesses, implement effective controls, and have regular monitoring, reconciliations, and physical inspections. This report shows a negative correlation between fraud controls and the median percentage of loss. More controls tend to be associated with a lower fraud loss rate. In addition, an organization can provide fraud detection systems such as tip hotlines, which we talked about, and open door policies where anonymity and confidentiality are guaranteed. In general, controls that minimize opportunities and motivation, along with strong fraud detection systems, will likely translate into a reduction of the losses due to fraud. Uh, Lena, do you have any examples of uh, <clears throat> anti-fraud controls? Sure, there's many, of course, Sharon. Um, but a few examples are implementing a code of conduct for the organization. A management's review of the financial statements, uh, having a tip hotline like we talked about, external audits by independent auditors, internal audits, which was a great question from the participants, an anti-fraud policy, proactive data monitoring, surprise audits of things such as cash or inventory, employee support programs, fraud training, which is my Personal favorite is a first line of defense because it's like the human firewall for fraud. And mandatory vacations and, and employee cross-training of functions. Yeah, the great ideas. Uh, also, I, I wondered uh, if uh, uh, what kinds of fraud schemes have the longest duration uh, in general, do you think? Yeah. So typically, um, payroll fraud issues, check payments and check, ta check tampering, cash register dis disbursements, financial statement fraud, and expense reimbursements and billing schemes all have an average duration in excess of two years, um, making them likely to have higher losses, as we talked about from the study. Most common scheme uh, reported in North America, and how, how were they detected? Brenna, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, I believe from the study, corruption provided 33% of cases, while billing schemes, 26%, followed by expense reimbursements at 19%. And tips accounted for 37% of initial detection, followed by management review at 15% and internal audit at 14%. Noteworthy here, the more common anti-fraud controls uh, reported was a code of conduct. I think that's important for our resorts that are in attendance today. A code of conduct and a conflict of interest policy. They're very simple controls that you can put into place. Of course, you have to enforce them and, and abide by them. But um, I think we've seen that those are some very easy and inexpensive ways to set a tone at the top and to kind of start that uh, controls over around fraud prevention. Okay, well, brilliant, ladies. I uh, don't believe we have any further questions. Uh, oh, we got some resources there, so I will I will butt out <laughs> for now. Oh no, that's fine. Um, you know, on our website we have a couple of links here. One is about forensics investigations and white collar criminal defense insights, and the other is about. Um, completely unrelated, but very timely, um, the stimulus package, updates and tools and uh, clarifications as they come out uh, available in our resource center. So we wanted to share those links in the event that they could be useful to someone. Well, this has been really uh, invaluable. It, uh, it, you know, not everybody's a reader, <laughs> and this was quite a, quite a long article, but uh, I felt like you touched on many of the points in the article, and I, I encourage our viewers to look up the article on resorttrades.com. Uh, the uh, URL is will be provided to you. 
and uh, I appreciate very much uh, your being here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sharon. It's our pleasure. We're glad to come and share. Hopefully, have, hopefully our participants got some valuable information today, at least one takeaway to go back and help them be more um, resolute about their own fraud detection controls. Well, I, I got lots out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank okay. you. Well, thank you. And have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you. Hi. I'm Sharon Scott Wilson, publisher of Resort Trades. We have been bringing you free videos in the hopes that we can help solidify the Timeshare Resort community and provide you, vacation ownership professional, uh, that you are with some useful information. So uh, when you hit the uh, like button or share or comment, you're helping yourself too to be more integrated into the community, uh, helping others get to know you. So be an influencer, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the bell icon so you'll be notified when we post a new video. And thank you. Good luck.